On a chilly autumn night, the air, crisp and echoing with the distant hoot of an owl, whispered of secrets and old stories long buried in the heart of Ashton, a small town known for its haunting urban legends. Sarah, an amateur writer with a deep fascination for the supernatural, had just moved in, renting a creaky old house that locals somewhat avoided, hinting at a dark past. Her fascination, tinged with a journalist's skepticism, drove her to uncover the truth behind these tales, which many claimed were nothing but fabrications to scare children. Her first stop was the local library, where the librarian, an elderly woman named Mrs. Mabel, wore a skeptical expression, her glasses perched on the edge of her nose. You're the new tenant at the Barker house, aren't you? My, my, that's brave or foolish, depending on how you see it, she commented, her voice, raspy from age, trailing off into a knowing chuckle. Despite the ominous start, Sarah pressed on, asking for any records or newspaper clippings about the town's legends. With a resigned sigh, Mrs. Mabel pointed to a dusty corner of the library where old boxes lay forgotten. Hours slipped by as Sarah dug through countless papers, her eyes scanning, absorbing every detail. The more she read, the more a particular story caught her attention, the legend of the Hollow Creek Bridge, just a few miles north of her new home. It was said that every year, on the night of October 14th, the spectral figure of a woman could be seen wandering the bridge, wailing for her lost child, who, decades ago, had vanished into the misty night never to be found again. Locals avoided the bridge, especially at night, convinced that the woman's spirit was a harbinger of doom for anyone who heard her mournful cries. Intrigued and determined, Sarah decided to visit the bridge herself on the fateful night, armed with her camera, voice recorder, and a healthy dose of skepticism. The evening was foggy, the moon, a mere sliver in the cloudy sky, casting feeble light on the path ahead. As she approached the bridge, her heart pounded in her chest, not from fear, but from the thrill of the hunt, the excitement of possibly uncovering a real ghost story. But nothing, not even her extensive research, could prepare her for what was to come. The bridge loomed ahead, its old, wooden planks creaking under her weight. She set up her equipment, her breath visible in the cold air forming little puffs of mist that seemed to blend with the dense fog surrounding her. Suddenly, a cold breeze swept through, sending a shiver down her spine, and the faint sound of weeping echoed across the creek. Sarah's eyes widened as her recorder picked up the sound, clear and unmistakably filled with sorrow. Gripping her camera tightly, she whispered into the night, Who's there? I mean you no harm. The weeping stopped abruptly, replaced by an eerie silence that seemed to press in on her from all sides. Then, just as she was about to speak again, a figure, pale and ethereal, appeared at the other end of the bridge. It was a woman, dressed in a flowing, white gown that seemed untouched by time, her eyes hollow, her expression tortured with grief. Sarah, her heart racing, raised her camera, her hands trembling as she snapped a picture. The flash briefly illuminated the area, and for a split second, the woman's eyes met hers, filled with an endless, piercing sorrow. Frozen in place, Sarah could only watch as the figure slowly approached, each step measured and slow. As the figure drew nearer, the temperature dropped sharply, her breath now a cloud of frost in front of her. The woman stopped just a few feet away, her presence overwhelming. Then, in a voice that was barely a whisper, but clear in the silent night, she spoke, Help me. The air thickened, the night sounds falling away until there was nothing but the two of them on that bridge. Sarah, her journalistic instincts kicking in, asked, What happened to your child? The spirit's story unfolded in a series of fragmented visions that flashed before Sarah's eyes, showing a night just like this one many years ago filled with laughter and then sudden, heart-wrenching despair. As the ghostly woman recounted her tale, the air around them grew colder and the mist thicker, as if the night itself was reacting to the pain and sorrow of the story. Each word was punctuated by the echo of the woman's cries, each sentence trailing off into the sounds of a distant, forgotten past. 
The story was not just a recounting, it felt alive, as if with each word, the tragic events of that night were replayed, the boundaries between past and present blurring dangerously. Sarah, her senses overwhelmed, realized that this was more than a simple ghost story. It was a plea for closure, a mother's desperate cry across the decades. As she stood there, the spectral figure fading in and out of sight, her mind raced with questions, the need to know more, to help somehow. But as she reached out, the figure disappeared, leaving behind a cold, lingering touch and a whisper in the wind, find him, please. The night suddenly seemed darker, the silence heavier. Sarah, her mind a whirl of emotions and thoughts, knew that this was just the beginning of her journey. There was more to this story, hidden in the shadows of the town's history, waiting to be uncovered. And as the first light of dawn crept over the horizon, she packed up her equipment, her resolve strengthened. She would find the truth, not just for the sake of her story, but for the restless spirit who could find no peace. Back at her house, the sun rising slowly, Sarah began to plan her next steps, unaware of the eyes watching her from the shadows, the past reaching out into the present, weaving a web that would pull her deeper into the mysteries of Ashton. The adventure was far from over, and the true horror, unbeknownst to her, was just beginning to unfold. As Sarah sat at her desk, the morning light casting long shadows across the room, her mind raced with the events of the previous night. The ghostly figure on the bridge, the haunting plea for help, had all seemed so real, so tangible. She pored over her notes, the images captured on her camera showing nothing but the empty bridge, shrouded in mist. Yet, the voice recorder played back the clear sound of weeping and that soft, desperate voice asking for help. She knew she couldn't dismiss it as just a figment of her imagination. There was something deeply unsettling about the whole encounter, something that tugged at her not just as a writer, but as a human being. Determined to delve deeper, Sarah decided her next step would be to visit the local historical society, hoping to uncover more about the woman and her lost child. The society was located in an old, Victorian building on the outskirts of town, its walls lined with photographs of Ashton's past, its shelves heavy with leather-bound books and old documents. The curator, a middle-aged man with a keen interest in the paranormal named Mr. Clarkson, greeted her with a mixture of curiosity and caution. You're treading on sensitive ground, young lady, he warned, his eyes, sharp and discerning, studying her with an intensity that made her slightly uncomfortable. The story of the woman on the bridge isn't just an urban legend. It's a painful part of our history, and some things are better left undisturbed. But Sarah, driven by a need to know, pressed on. She explained her encounter, watching as Mr. Clarkson's skepticism shifted slowly to reluctant acceptance. He sighed, a deep, weary sound that seemed to carry the weight of unspoken stories. Very well. He conceded, I'll tell you what I know. The curator led her to a secluded part of the library where dusty tomes and ancient maps filled the air with the scent of old paper. He pulled out a faded newspaper clipping dated back to 1954, the headline stark and ominous, local woman's desperate search for missing son ends in tragedy. The article detailed the story of Anne Whitmore, a widow whose only son, Michael, had disappeared one foggy evening while playing near the Hollow Creek Bridge. Despite an extensive search, the boy was never found and then, driven by grief and despair, was later seen walking the bridge at night, calling out for her son until she too disappeared. Her body was found three days later in the creek, Mr. Clarkson continued, his voice low and somber. The official cause of death was drowning, but folks around here knew better. They say she died of a broken heart, her spirit unable to leave this world while her child was still lost. Sarah listened, her heart heavy, her mind swirling with images of Anne's sorrowful search. She felt a chill run down her spine as she considered the implications. Was the ghost on the bridge really Anne Whitmore? And if so, what did she mean by find him, please? I need to find out what happened to Michael, she declared more to herself than to Mr. Clarkson. 
If in spirit is to find any peace, I have to know if there's any chance her son might still be alive, or at least discover what really happened to him. Mr. Clarkson regarded her with a mixture of admiration and concern. Be careful, he cautioned. Some doors, once opened, can never be closed again. You might not like what you find on the other side. Armed with a copy of the newspaper article and a list of people who had been involved in the original search for Michael, Sarah set out to track down anyone who might still remember the events of that fateful night. Her first visit was to the home of Eleanor Rigby, an elderly woman whose father had been the chief of police at the time of Michael's disappearance. The old woman lived alone in a small, ivy-covered house at the edge of town, her eyes bright and clear despite her advanced age. She welcomed Sarah in, offering tea and sympathy, her hands trembling slightly as she poured. I remember Annie Whitmore, she began, her voice quavering with the weight of old memories. She was a kind soul, didn't deserve any of what happened to her. And poor little Michael, he was such a bright boy. Eleanor paused, sipping her tea, her gaze distant. My father, he did everything he could to find the boy. But there was something off about that night, something he never spoke of openly. He was a practical man, didn't believe in curses or ghosts. But after that night, he was different, quieter, and more withdrawn. Sarah leaned in, her recorder capturing every word, the implications of Eleanor's statement sending a shiver through her. Did he ever mention anything specific? Any detail that might help explain what he experienced? Eleanor set her cup down, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. Only once, she whispered, her voice barely audible. He talked about the mist, how it seemed alive, moving against the wind, swirling around Michael as he played by the bridge. He said it didn't feel natural, more like it was there for a purpose. And then, the boy was gone, as if swallowed up by the fog itself. Sarah felt a chill settle over her as she processed Eleanor's words. The mist, the same mist that had been present the night she saw Anne's ghost. Was it possible that there was more to the legend than just a grieving mother's spirit? Was the mist some sort of portal, a gateway between worlds that had claimed not just Michael, but Anne as well? Her mind raced with possibilities, each more unsettling than the last. She knew she was on the cusp of uncovering something profound, something that might change not just her understanding of the supernatural, but could shed light on a decades-old mystery that had haunted the town of Ashton. As she left Eleanor's house, the sky darkening and the wind picking up, Sarah felt the weight of the story she was unraveling. But she also felt a resolve stealing within her, a determination to get to the bottom of this, no matter what it took. As the night fell and the first hints of mist began to curl around the edges of the town, Sarah's thoughts were a whirlwind of theories and plans. Her next step was clear. She needed to visit Hollow Creek Bridge again, this time under different circumstances. She needed to see if the mist would appear to test her growing suspicion that it was more than just a natural phenomenon. As she prepared her equipment, checking her camera and voice recorder, her hands were steady but her heart was not. Tonight, she was not just a ghost hunter, but a seeker of truths long buried, truths that were waiting for her, hidden in the swirling mists of Hollow Creek Bridge. The bridge loomed ahead, its structure more ominous by night, the wood creaking underfoot as she stepped onto it. The air was cold, colder than it should have been this time of year, and the mist began to rise from the water below, creeping along the ground like a living thing. Sarah's breath fogged in the air, her heart beat loud in her ears as she waited, watched, and wondered what secrets tonight might reveal. Her camera was ready, her finger on the trigger, but nothing could prepare her for what was about to unfold. As the mist thickened, swirling around her like a cold embrace, she felt a sudden drop in temperature and a faint, almost imperceptible whisper brushed against her ear, help us. The words, so soft, so desperate, were barely audible over the sound of her own breathing. But they were clear enough, 
and Sarah spun around, her camera flashing, capturing the mist in bursts of light, her heart pounding as she called into the night, who's there? Who needs help? But there was no answer, only the sound of the creek below and the rustling of leaves in the wind. The mist seemed to pulse with a life of its own, ebbing and flowing like the tide, and Sarah felt a pull, a tug at her soul that was both terrifying and irresistible. She stepped forward, her feet moving of their own accord, drawn into the heart of the mist, where the air was so cold it burned her lungs. Her camera flashed again, a beacon in the darkness, and for a moment, just a moment, she thought she saw figures in the mist, shadows of people long lost, reaching out to her. Then everything went still. The mist settled, and the night was silent once more. Sarah stood alone on the bridge, her heart racing, her mind reeling. What had just happened? Had she seen ghosts, or had her imagination carried her away? She didn't know, couldn't know, not yet. But she was certain of one thing, she was no longer just an observer in this story. She was a part of it, and whatever truths lay hidden in the mist of Hollow Creek Bridge, she was determined to uncover them. As she packed up her equipment, her hands trembling with a mix of fear and excitement, Sarah knew that her investigation was far from over. There were more nights to come, more mysteries to unravel, and she was ready to face them, no matter how dark or daunting they might be. The story of Hollow Creek Bridge was just beginning, and Sarah was right at the heart of it, caught between the world of the living and the whispers of the dead. As she left the bridge, the mist swirling behind her, a sense of foreboding filled the air, a promise that this was only the beginning, and that the true horror was yet to come. As Sarah drove away from Hollow Creek Bridge, the mist fading behind her like a bad dream, her mind whirled with the night's surreal events. The ghostly whispers, the chilling touch of the unseen, had left her more determined but significantly more rattled. Arriving home, she quickly set up her workspace with notes and recordings spread out like a map to hidden treasure. The historical tapestry of Ashton was slowly unraveling before her, each thread pulling her deeper into its ghostly grip. Late into the night, Sarah poured over the recordings, enhancing the audio to catch every nuance of the whispered voices. Again, she heard it, the plaintive cry, help us, woven into the very fabric of the mist. It was not just one voice, but many, as if the mist itself was a collector of souls, trapping the residents of Ashton in its cold, damp clutches. Her eyes, heavy with fatigue, barely blinked as she documented every sound, every syllable. The story was growing, becoming more than just an article, it was becoming a mission. The next day, armed with a thermos full of coffee and a digital recorder, Sarah returned to the library. This time, her focus was on any similar disappearances or unusual occurrences around the bridge. Mrs. Mabel, who had become a reluctant ally, helped her dig through old microfiche reels. What they discovered was unsettling, a pattern of disappearances dating back decades, each occurring on foggy October nights, each never solved, the victim simply vanished without a trace. Seems you're onto something dark, dear, Mrs. Mabel noted, her voice low, worried. Be careful, Sarah. Some truths aren't just hidden, they're buried for a reason. Ignoring the chill that ran down her spine, Sarah thanked her and headed back to the bridge. This time, she brought more equipment, cameras, audio recorders, even a thermal imaging camera. She set everything up in the fading light, her hands steady despite the fear that tinged her movements. The sun dipped below the horizon and the mist began to rise, slithering across the ground with serpentine grace. The night grew darker, the mist thicker, and Sarah's monitors started to pick up anomalies. Cold spots in the air, figures appearing on the thermal imaging camera, voices whispering through the static of the audio recorder. It was happening again, but more intensely. The air around her vibrated with the energy of the unseen, and the mist felt alive, pulsing with the heartbeats of those it had swallowed. Then, amid the chaos of signals and sounds, a 
clearer voice emerged, its tone urgent. Find the stone beneath the old oak where the shadows lie deepest, it instructed, the words cutting through the mist with startling clarity. Sarah's heart raced as she tried to understand. An oak tree? The bridge was surrounded by them. Which one? She grabbed a flashlight and began to search frantically, her breath a white cloud in the cold air. Finally, under the largest oak near the bridge, where shadows pooled like dark water, she found it. Buried beneath layers of earth and leaves was a stone, flat and smooth with carvings that were barely visible. Excitement mixed with fear as she brushed off the dirt, revealing symbols and a name, Michael Whitmore. The stone was a marker, a forgotten piece of the puzzle. It was not just a grave, it was a seal. Sarah realized with a shock that the mist was not just a natural phenomenon. It was a barrier, a thin veil between worlds held in place by this stone. Michael, and perhaps others, had been lost to a world beyond, their spirits caught in the perpetual fog, unable to find peace. The air grew colder, the mist thicker, as if responding to her discovery. Voices swirled around her, more insistent now, their whispers like cold fingers on her neck. Release us, they begged. Sarah knew what she had to do. Taking a deep breath, she prepared to remove the stone to break the seal. But as she touched the stone, the ground beneath her trembled and the air filled with a terrible, mournful wail. The bridge began to shudder, the boards groaning under an unseen weight. Fear gripped her, but so did determination. She pulled at the stone, her muscles straining, her breaths short and sharp. With a final, desperate tug, the stone came free and the air exploded with light and sound. The mist surged upward, spiraling into the sky like a reverse whirlpool, the voices crescendoing into a choir of release. And then, just as suddenly, silence fell. The mist dissolved, the stars twinkling brightly in a clear night sky, the bridge quiet and still. Panting, heart pounding, Sarah stared at the space where the mist had been, her mind struggling to comprehend what had just happened. The voices were gone, the air was clear, and for the first time in decades, Hollow Creek Bridge was just an ordinary bridge again. As she gathered her equipment, her body weary but her spirit lifted, Sarah knew her story was far from over. There was more to tell, more to uncover about the town and its newly liberated spirits. But that would have to wait for another day, another night. For now, she had done what she came to do. She had broken the curse of Hollow Creek Bridge, and in doing so, had freed the lost souls of Ashton. But the true end of her story, the final chapter, would come later, when she was ready to face it, ready to write it down and share it with the world. As Sarah packed up her equipment on the now quiet Hollow Creek Bridge, the night seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. The stars shone clearer than they had in decades, and the chill that had lingered in the air was now replaced by a serene calm. However, the weight of what had transpired sat heavily upon her shoulders. The voices were gone, the mist had cleared, and yet, the echoes of those whispered pleas lingered in her mind, haunting her with their desperation. She drove back to her home, the town of Ashton now sleeping peacefully, blissfully unaware of the supernatural storm that had just passed. As she entered her house, the familiar creak of the old wooden floors greeted her like an old friend. She set down her equipment with care, her mind replaying the night's events over and over. The voices, the trembling earth, the surge of the mist, all had been so visceral, so intense, that it felt more like a battle than a mere spectral encounter. Over the next few days, Sarah dedicated herself to writing the story. Her fingers flew over the keyboard, capturing every detail, every emotion. She wrote of the history of Hollow Creek Bridge, of the tragic tale of Ed and Michael Whitmore, and of the other souls lost to the mist. She wrote of her fears, her doubts, and ultimately, her actions that led to the breaking of the curse. The article was published on a crisp Sunday morning. 
It quickly caught the attention of not just Ashton's residents, but also paranormal enthusiasts and skeptics from far and wide. People were captivated by the tale of a curse broken and spirits freed. They discussed it in cafes, shared it on social media, and some even ventured to the bridge, now just a normal crossing, stripped of its ghostly shroud but rich with history. Yet, for Sarah, the end of the story on paper was not the end of her journey. The events at Hollow Creek Bridge had changed her, had opened her eyes to a world that was much stranger, much more complex than she had ever imagined. Her nights were restless, filled with dreams of mist and voices, and a lingering sense of unfinished business. One evening, as she sat reviewing her notes, pondering over her next project, a knock came at her door. It was Mr. Clarkson from the Historical Society. His face was serious, the usual twinkle in his eye replaced by a somber shadow. Sarah, there's something you need to see, he said, handing her a small, old leather-bound book. I found this hidden away in a locked cabinet at the Society. It seems to be a diary of sorts, belonging to the founder of Ashton. I think it might help explain why the mist was there in the first place. With trembling hands, Sarah opened the diary. The pages were yellowed with age, the writing faded but still legible. It told of a time long before the bridge, before the town itself. It spoke of a land sacred to the native people, a place of power where the veil between worlds was thin. The founder had known of this power and had used the stone to seal it, not realizing that it would trap not just the energies of the land, but also the souls of those who perished nearby. As Sarah read, a deep understanding dawned upon her. The mist had been more than a prison, it had been a cry for help, not just from the trapped spirits, but from the land itself, wounded by misunderstanding and misuse. She knew then what she needed to do. The story of Hollow Creek Bridge was not just to be told, it was to be righted. Determined, Sarah wrote another article, this one delving deeper into the history of the land, calling for recognition of its sacredness and for measures to protect and honor it. Her words stirred the hearts of the people of Ashton, leading to a new awareness of their town's history and a commitment to its preservation. Months later, a small park was established around Hollow Creek Bridge. A plaque was placed, detailing its history and the story of the night the mist was freed. Sarah often visited, finding peace in the rustle of the leaves and the gentle flow of the creek below. The bridge had become a symbol of Ashton's journey from fear to understanding, from superstition to respect. And sometimes, just sometimes, on clear October nights, if one stood on the bridge and listened closely, the wind seemed to whisper thanks, its voice mingling with the creek's murmurs, a haunting yet beautiful reminder of the past that was once shrouded in mist but was now remembered in the stars.